What up, Unstoppable? So I'm actually coming at you from Chef David Kirshner's uh, residential. I'm, yes, these are toys behind me. I'm in the, the playroom. It's probably where I belong, but it was the quietest spot to record this little intro. So I'm about to go talk to Chef David Kirshner. Incredible lineage with this guy. He interned at Per Se. He's worked for restaurant tours like Michael Mina and Daniel Balud. And uh, he is the founder and CEO and executive chef of Dine DK. Uh, which specializes in private chefing, uh, special events. He flies, he's a network of chefs that he, he flies all over the country. And this is a whole different type of interview for me. I've never had somebody who specializes in a, a business like this on the show. So I'm really excited to pull back the layers. And it's kind of goes along this theme of getting outside of the traditional restaurant business model. There's a ton of different verticals that get creative in, in have a unique selling proposition and whatever it truly is about you that you love about this industry like you don't have to go through the traditional mode you can you can lean into your strengths and your passions so i think that's going to come out of today's conversation and i'm super excited for it this episode brought to you by restaurant systems pro you get into per se what was it like so i i was part of the team over at per se at a really interesting time yeah. in its life it was its second anniversary so we talk about how old and how long it's been around for at this point I was there when French Laundry was still number two on the San Pellegrino list. Per se was sitting there at number six. So it was, as I said, second anniversary, brand new on the scene. Times Warner building had really just opened up the whole food area um, not too long ago. And it was intense. It was everything that I was looking for from, you know, staying up late and reading every Thomas Keller book and get my hands on. and really wanting to establish at a really early part of my career just the baseline of how good it can be. And I was blown away. I mean, I worked my tail off. Um, it was like six days on, 12 to 14 hours a day, just like the grind um, everybody would expect. But I mean, going inside of there and seeing how different it can be. And at this point in my career, I already worked at a ton of different restaurants around Providence, Rhode Island. I had done a bunch of restaurants during my summers in between um, back in Jersey before I was going back to school. So I'd already kind of cut my teeth in smaller shops uh, where you can really touch every aspect of it. And this was my first time being part of a really massive brigade. You had your area that you were hyper-focused on as an extern there. I had my core responsibilities that I was responsible for service every day, whether you know I started out in the meat cutting room working with a guy named Ruby, who I remember the, the old goal was if I could do one for every two that he did, I was on pace, nice. meaning he deboned you know, two chickens, I could debone one chicken and I'm good. No, how long was he there though? What, what was that muscle memory? Like? Oh my God, the muscle memory is incredible. <laughs> yeah. This is a guy who can like, you know, debone a rabbit in his sleep and getting yeah. around those V bones that are inside those wings is like a nightmare for a person <laughs> who's never done it before. Uh, so really like establishing that baseline of how good it can be done and just the level of respect was something I never really had been a part of before. What I mean that is, you know, Chef Jonathan Benno, who was our executive chef at the time, he's calling me Chef Kirshner. You know, he's coming around saying, Chef, how are you doing with everything? Like, where are you at with your prep list each day? And this aspect of calling each other chef, you know, looking a particular way, keeping yourself pressed, primped, groomed, and just taking so much pride in what you're creating at the smallest level. I mean, the old stories of Keller, you know, being on his own hands and knees, polishing the brass pipes at the end of the night kind of speaks volumes to how intense it can be. I mean... Every other week, we're taking toothbrushes to the hinges of the fridges and the reach-ins to make sure everything's in pristine condition at all times. Yeah. And I had gotten some really amazing advice uh, when I was at Per Se from Chris Lamadou, the executive sous chef over there. Lamadou had also come from Michael Mina in his background. He was at, I'm pretty sure, Michael Mina's flagship out in San Francisco for a majority of his career. And when I was, I remember when my internship was coming to a close at Per Se, I actually got a job offer. It was the time when the HACCP program and sous vide was getting cracked down in New York City. I had done a 25 page research paper, which was like my senior internship project at Per Se, which was used as part of the bones of not only establishing their HACCP plan, but actually uh, Chef Benno had given me, just a fun kind of side story, Benno had given me the original manuscript for Under Pressure, Keller's sous vide book, okay. and was like, I want you to structure your paper the way that we're structuring this book, as they were in the middle of writing it, and see if there's maybe a potential you know, for some overlap or some use for us through this. And that was the whole bones of this project. Johnson Wales was like, do something that benefits you and benefits the place you're at. Mm. And that was like the bones of what you had to go down the pathway of. Lamadou had basically said to me, he goes, we're not a real restaurant here. He goes, yes, you could come work here. You could take the job that Chef Benno offered you. 
Um, first off, I should say when Benno offered me the job, he went, I have something I want to talk to you about. And then he goes, when are you graduating from culinary school? I go, I have one trimester left, so three more months. He goes, okay, nothing then. And gets up and starts to walk away from the table. And I'm like, chef, chef, like, what are you, what's going on? And he goes, well, I was going to offer you this position as I just laid it out. But he goes, but I'm not going to because I know you'll say yes and you have to go finish school. Uh. He's like, you made it this far. Go finish. We're always going to be here. If you want yeah. to come back, make a phone call. We'll figure out a way to get you back in the mix. Yeah. Lamadou pulls me on the side and basically goes, we're not a real restaurant. And if you come back to us, you're going to be stuck in the Comi kitchen for the next two years because you don't see the resumes we get. We're getting the best resumes from the best line cooks and chef de parties from around the world that want to work here. And where have you worked? Like you're going to be cutting tomato concasse for the next two years if you come back here. He goes, go work at a real restaurant, a place that cranks, a place that does real numbers, a place that actually generates money, a place that you can actually understand what this industry is about, not La La Land. You just hit on something that I think is really important. And I was hoping it would come out. A place that actually generates money. I yeah. think this is probably one of the biggest issues with our industry mm -hmm. is that we look at the French laundries, the per se's, the and I'm not I'm not beating up on Thomas Keller. Yeah. Like he's he's been very successful. It's a business model that works for very few people. Absolutely. And you need the Michelin stars of the world, the James Beards of the world mm -hmm. to get up on your shit in <laughs> order for that to be successful. Here's the thing: there's only so many stars and so many awards to be handed out. Right. And there's a lot of amazing people doing amazing food out there, but there's just not enough awards to go out. Those they serve you. an incredible purpose, right? Yeah. The purpose is to, you know, keep up with fine dining, to push the agenda of culinary cuisine on the world map and, and really just challenge what our notions are of eating and dining and all of this. And it's all beautiful and it's all inspiring as hell. Um, but yeah, when you talk about running an actual business that, you know, the old idea of the chef owner could start, I mean, it's really hard to do that and try to actually maintain the margins, maintain the staffing Take levels. Take care of you your people. To actually have a, a, a life that's able to be led in a balanced way yeah. in some capacity. Yeah. To speak frankly, I need to go get my ass kicked on the line yeah. somewhere. I need to go be a part of a place that doesn't serve 100 people a night with like 40 people on staff. Yeah. You know, or the hotline is like 15 or something yeah. like that. You know, it's they're not real numbers. Like, how do you crank? So that first experience with Michael Mina boils down to that. Okay. Um, I got a good offer. It was part of a union, so I got a better hourly rate than I would have if I just came back to New York City to go just cut my teeth in a tiny, you know, Lower East Side restaurant or join another kind of temple of gastronomy. And I also love what Michael Mina was doing. He's his angle was really unique, bringing Egyptian and Middle Eastern flavors into this fine dining spectrum, um, and to get a taste of that on the East Coast when his whole world and kind of infrastructure was out west, I thought was an awesome opportunity. Uh, so I had moved down to Brigantine, New Jersey, kind of got this job at the Borgata and started cranking. And listen, that's where I learned how to do 500 covers a night, you know, with a team of, what is it? One, two, three, four. You know, you probably have about 12 to 15 on the line. So it's almost the same amount of people working the service at per se, but we're doing 500 plus covers a night in a really intense matter. Plus we're doing tasting menus. Michael Mina had just released his cookbook. So we're doing the cookbook tasting menu and also getting to be in this kind of awesome environment. So who doesn't want to be, you know, 21, 22 years old and working in a casino that you can also party in yeah. while you also work all day. So, yeah. you know, it was, it was a great balance, but that was really where I learned to kind of get my ass kicked hardcore in a line. Um, anything we haven't discussed up to this point at the end of the day, I think the best advice I can give anybody is really it's taking an assessment of your resources and truly what success means to you. I there were two topics that we touched on yep. a bit earlier, but listen, money only gets you so far in life. I think happiness is an incredibly important and powerful piece and really kind of taking a look at what the skills that you have that you might not even realize are going to be the most valuable ones to you.